Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Crescent Avenue Presbyterian Church. I am so glad that you are here. What a time to be able to worship our God who is so amazing. He laid down his very life that we might have eternal life. What more glory of God could we worship? We also want to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day. And for those who like cats, happy St. Gertrude's Day. Poor Gertrude always gets written off. We remember Patrick, we forget Gertrude, but not here at Crescent. We remember both men and women. So happy day today. But now, let us turn our hearts and minds to the glorious worship of our God. <laughs> Um, please uh, stand if you are able for the call to worship. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Who bears our burdens and forgives our sins. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This. <coughs> Maybe seated. And let us center ourselves in the love of Christ before his presence in humility and hope and grace and peace, but most of all in love. Let us pray together our prayer of confession that is in our bulletin. Redeeming God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart and have not loved our neighbors as we ought. We have strayed from your commandments. Do not remember our sins, but forgive our iniquities, that we may fix our eyes on you and sin no more. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us offer our silent prayers of confession.
Amen. Now what? As we think about the gift that we have given to the atoning sacrifice of our Lord, how could it not bring us to our knees? How could we not approach our Lord with great humility and awe? That he loved us so much, even when we were so unlovable. To redeem us and call us home. A home that's a deepest sense of home, more than we've ever known in our entire life. Hear the good news of the gospel. With your whole being, your heart, your mind, your soul, your body. The good news. Embrace that peace with everything that you have because it truly is holy and a gift from a God who loves you so much that he went to the cross for you and for me. May that holy peace of Christ be with you all. As brothers and sisters in Christ, united as the body of Christ within this community of faith, We are called to extend that blessed peace of Christ one to another. Let us do so with joyful and open hearts. prayer for illumination. Your word, O God, has power to change our lives and to create a whole new world. As we meditate on your word this day, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may treasure your word with our whole hearts and fix our eyes on you. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The Psalter reading today is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. We will read it responsibly with the congregation reading the bold text. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. With my lips, I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all the wishes. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The New Testament reading is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, 
according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Let us listen for God's word for us today. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks this week. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. Don't we wish to see Jesus? No matter what we're going through, isn't it Christ that we're really looking for? Whether we name it like that or not, it is Christ that we turn our eyes to in the midst of our troubles because we know it is from him alone that we will receive comfort and support to be able to bear what is it is that we are facing. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. <clears throat> what it must have been like to look upon his face, to stand in his presence. But John, we know, the best Greek in our Bible, a very intelligent and careful writer, this sentence, sir, we wish to see Jesus, for John, seeing has a whole new level to it than just looking, right? You can see somebody, but do you really see them? That's the deeper meaning that John is trying to convey here. We want to see Jesus, not look upon his face, not just the surface experience, but we want to see with a level of understanding and depth and faith that we might become the disciples that he calls us to be. That's what is behind this sign. And you know, Jesus doesn't answer or talk about the Greeks. He said now he knows that his time has come because the prophecy has been fulfilled. Now people beyond the Jewish community have recognized in Christ <coughs> something special, something unique, something powerful. <coughs> something that can transform their lives. But John doesn't write about 
Jesus going out and just saying to the Greeks, hi, it's nice to meet you, I'm Jesus, you know, you're Joe, you know. What he talks about is this idea of a grain of wheat falling into the earth and dying. John writes at a far deeper level. This idea of dying to ourselves is how we begin to see Jesus. But boy, it's really hard to die to ourselves. What is it? Are we supposed to beat ourselves up? Are we supposed to just think terrible? No, that's not what this is talking about. What he's saying is that if you are to see me, watch what I do. And the act of love that he offers as a complete abdication of his will, if you will, to God's will, and instead embraces a suffering and an exaltation that only God could accomplish. And yet he calls us to follow in this way. He says those who love their life will lose it. They won't get to see Jesus. Well, this morning as I was scanning through Facebook, there was a picture of a celebrity leaving an Oxford church. Well, the comments were just, I can't believe, is he, going, is he actually going to church? No, he can't be going to church. Oh no, we can never have any of that. And then this whole dialogue of why people don't go to church. Church for me, they said, one comment. I, I so wanted to respond. I'm, I'm kind of like, I want to, I shouldn't, I want to. You know. But this woman writes back and she says, you know, I know, I know that my faith is whatever it is that fills me. I don't need to go to church. I just need to feel good. You know, as long as I'm feeling good about myself, that's enough. How wrong can you possibly be? Do we not look at what the gospel is? If we do not attend church, if we do not go to study, if we don't take this stuff seriously, we are going to fall into those traps, and they are traps. It is not about us. And Jesus is saying that as clearly as he possibly can. To the Greeks that are coming, to people that want to really understand what this is all about, he said, you have to die to yourself. In other words, your own self-will and what you want and what you think is not what carries the message. It is about what God wills and that we find comfort and assurance in that truth because what he wills for us is a will for love and for good even though it might not look like that at the time. Do we think the suffering of Christ was any less because he knew what was going to happen? I think he felt all the pain and horror that the world was throwing at him. So what is it that he really overcame? He didn't buy into that power structure's truth, if you will. And I will add on the kind of feel-good faith that doesn't challenge us because, oh, we would not want to be told that we're wrong. We would not want to be told that, would we? No, because that challenges us to look at ourselves, and that's really uncomfortable. But if we're feeling uncomfortable, maybe that's exactly what we should be feeling at the moment because God wants us take, to take us to another level. The horror, the shock that somebody of any celebrity status would seek to honor God in worship. How appalling could that be? Truly is a sign of where we stand in the world today. I know we have much concern about politics and the world and the nations and all that, but you know what? What I'm really concerned about is people's lack of faith in something beyond their own selves. I'm not saying that all of us that go to church are perfect. I know for a fact I am not. <clears throat> and I know for a fact you're not either. But that's okay. That's how God has created us, so that we can grow and we can learn. When we think we're standing on the side of the right, we ought to just be a little careful and a little more humble to make sure that we're standing 
with God. How easily, and we talked about this at the Bible study on Wednesday, last Wednesday, how easily, I mean, we can look at other people and go down the list and say, well, I can tell you what's wrong with you. Just give me a few minutes. But the challenge is really to sit down and say, Lord, help me to see what's wrong with me. What am I holding on to? What are the fears that are clouding my vision? What is the pain that I need to bear that I might understand you a little more. That is how we overcome the world, because Christ has overcome the world. That is where our hope and our salvation comes through our Lord, who did all of this for us, but calls us into a life of discipleship. Discipleship has to cost us something. It costs us ourselves, but a broken self that we might instead trade it for an eternal self. A whole different way of looking at life. That's what is behind this reading of John. And Jesus said even for himself, he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? Now, John's Gospel certainly has the highest Christology, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a little more humble view of Jesus, that he struggled, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying. John does not have that kind of understanding. Jesus almost climbs right up upon the cross himself. Here he says, you know, no, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Who knows how it is that we are being changed by the trials that we face? And maybe they are just the lessons we need to learn that we might live into the story that God has for us. How is it that our struggles can help to open our eyes? I think those of faith, when they go through difficult times, look upon others with greater compassion and do not run from pain, because they know what it is to live with it. When you know somebody is going through a rough time, and you take the time to ask them how they are doing, I think that's the gospel in action. I think when we look upon somebody else, <coughs> If they have no voice, that we lend our voice and help. That's, I think, the gospel in action. That's putting ourselves second and putting God first. <clears throat> Yesterday, I went to visit Mary Jo. Her daughter had texted me and asked me to come down. I have to say, it can be difficult. I love Mary Jo. And it's hard to see Mary Jo struggle. She wants to go in the worst way. Jesus, show me the way. She said, take me home. But it's not on our time, is it? It's in his time. The act of trust and faith is forged, I think, in the most difficult of hours. It is when we break apart that we begin to feel, I think, God's grace seep in. People's reactions to it are very difficult and different. A voice that it comes from heaven, while some may already begin to argue about it. In John's Gospel, we see this division amongst people. When something happens, when God does something, people can be very divided as to what it means. He says, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Jesus did not need affirmation from God. He already had it. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out for those who see Jesus. Because he laid his life down for others.
Recently, I made a gift. And it was a gift, frankly, that caused me to squirm a little. It pinched. But isn't that the best kind of gift when it really costs you something? It doesn't always have to be financial. It can be emotional. And yet it's a gift that I gave freely and willingly and lovingly. Our lives as Christians should be different than those of the crowd. Certainly, I think, than those on Facebook. I don't know yet. I don't think people have been converted based on responses to Facebook. I wish they did, but I don't think that's the forum or the context for it to happen. All that will envelop is just more arguments and back and forth. And if I see anything, I see it's name-calling and slander. When we no longer are able to debate and discuss, we just call people names. That is not a higher form of debate or dialogue. It's juvenile infantile, and certainly not Christian. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. It takes a lot of courage, I think, to say that prayer. But I think when we are in the depths of life, when we really are getting a sense of the reality of what is out there and what is within ourselves, those words, we wish to see Jesus, we wish to understand, we wish to be disciples, we wish to be drawn closer, we wish to know that we might have eternal life and know the joy of being his truly is. To have the assurance of the promises that no matter what we go through, he will be there with us all along the way. He will not let us go. A love so deep, so amazing. That even if we would walk away, he never would. I hope that in the season of Lent, that we will get a deeper look at Jesus. The truth of what he proclaims. The power of the gospel. The amazing gift an act of love which he offered to all of us. I hope we get a good look. But better yet, I hope that look transforms us in a way that we will walk away different people. That we will be able to turn from fears and doubts and stand a little taller and walk a little straighter in his path. And remember to reach out to others in need, to share that light and that truth, not with trying to convert them, but showing them love. In the name of Jesus Christ, may be so, and all God's people who want to see Jesus said, Amen. Amen.
just remain standing, but I want you to think before we say this creed. We don't say these words just because they're words and it's got to be said because it's in our liturgy. We say these words because this is a witness of our faith. This is a witness of our faith against the darkness of the world. And I'll tell you, it is all around us. So as we proclaim our words of faith today, I invite you to do so and envision in your mind that you were speaking against the darkness and the violence and the hatred and the lack of faith that there is that surrounds us, to speak God's word against all of us. Let us proclaim our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So as we come to this time of offering, we recall that we are called to offer our very selves for the building up of God's kingdom. That his spirit that moves through us moves through in a powerful way as we open ourselves to his presence. The offering is not just only what we put in the plate, but our heart and soul and everything that we invest in God and in our faith. So let us do so with open and joyful and generous hearts.
Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for the gospel, for the power and gift of salvation and eternal life. We give you thanks that you have called us into this community of faith and blessed us with the calling of discipleship. We give you thanks with all that we have and all that we are and pray that you will take these, our humble gifts, bless them and magnify them to your glory for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who truly is our Lord and our Savior, and all his disciples said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I know I announced last week that this was Palm Sunday and we were heading into Holy Week. I'm so glad you didn't listen to me. But now I'm right when I say that next Sunday is Palm Sunday and we're going to be heading into Holy Week. I invite you to be part of those services. I still need a couple people to help me with the stripping of the chancel for Monday Thursday, so if you would like to be part of that, please let me know. Also, too, on the back of your bulletin, you'll see the flyer for the 2024 Easter flowers, how glorious it will be to honor your loved ones and <coughs> church and, and with flowers uh, for that Easter Sunday. So please fill that out and get that in as soon as you can so we can make sure all of those names get into our bulletin and celebrate all that we love. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation? Uh, Jerry and BJ. Cancer's gone? Wow, amazing. Awesome. Congratulations. Exciting. Thank you, Jerry. BJ? Thank you. Yes, you can't forget the nibbles. Yes, the comfort coffee hour. Glorious time. Here we go. Let's continue in worship and let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks for the blessings in our lives. We know we can come before you in want and need and in rejoicing and praise. We give you thanks that you journey with us through every day of our life. And we give you thanks for the gift and promise of eternal life, which begins now. Lord, on this day, we especially lift up before you Richard and Barbara, Louis and James, we celebrate that Craig is cancer-free and give thanks for all the doctors, nurses, and caregivers, for your angels, the power of your spirit. We pray for Glenn and Druda, for Dudley and Hank. We pray for Michael and Vivian, Henry, Carol, and David. We pray for Kevin for our brother Henry, for Colleen and Ivan and Carla. We pray for Stephen, for Alex, for Jill, for Elizabeth, for our sister Janet and Frank and Peggy. We pray for Siobhan and Marty and Tyrone and Ray, Richard, Alan, Daryl, Howard, and our sister Winnie. We pray for all those who are homebound, not only in their home, but homebound to the eternal kingdom. We lift up especially before you our sister Mary Jo. Lord, hear the prayers on her heart. <coughs> Help her to transition to your kingdom and glory with peace and joy. We pray for Lorraine and for Ron. Lord, hear their prayers and their heart, especially the ones that are so deep that they go beyond words. We pray for the peace for the world, for wisdom for world leaders, for healing for all traumatized by the effects of war, 
We pray for Peter as he travels to Nepal. Watch over him, Lord. Keep him safe. All these prayers and so many more we lift up to you in the words that your Son, our Savior, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise and sing with great joy, O oh, Jesus, I have promised, number 388. Now go from here as the children of God, because that is truly who you are. Shake off the world, because the world has got nothing on you as long as you belong to Christ. Go out and proclaim the good news of the gospel through everything that you say and do. And may the light of Christ shine so brightly through you that people will be drawn to his love. And I pray the Lord bless and keep you, and cause his holy face to shine brightly upon you, and that he will fill you with the blessings of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, may be so, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. 